Welcome to our final set of notes in Unit 10 on Personality. In this one, we're going to be looking at social cognitive perspective and our sense of self, right? So uh, I don't want you to confuse the whole self thing with humanism, okay? So just because we're talking about self here doesn't mean we're talking about humanism, and we'll get more, more into that. So social cognitive, those two perspectives really kind of combining to have this approach on personality and here are the ideals they believe that we learn behaviors okay so they believe we learn behaviors from conditioning observing and modeling and I don't want you to think of this as behaviorist although it has some of those those ideas but think of the social part in the observing and modeling. They're watching others, right? And they emphasize the importance of mental processing, hence cognitive, and it focuses on how we and our environment interact. So how we and our environment are interacting together. It's a combination of the behavioral and cognitive perspectives. So it emphasizes the interaction of our traits within our situations. Okay, so it's looking at our traits and the situations. Trait theory, and you could write this in a sidebar somewhere, trait theory is criticized for underestimating the situation because they say that we behave the same given our traits no matter the situation. Well, social cognitive is saying, no, you have to, you have to at least recognize what the situation is. The big name of this one is Albert Bandura, which we've seen before. He's well known for his theories of observational learning with the Bobo doll experiment. And he came up with something called reciprocal determinism. And it says that our personality is shaped by an interaction of essentially three things. Our cognitive factors, which is like our internal personal factors. Okay, our thinking, which it shows you in this graphic here, cognitive being our beliefs, values, thoughts, and feelings. Interacting with our behaviors, which is our outward reactions or outward actions. And then our environmental factors, social influences like family, media, and peers, hence the social part of the social cognitive approach. An example being that hard work will take you far, that's your cognitive, that's the belief, right? So you study hard, you get good grades, that's the behavioral part. And then you're praised by parents, admired by friends, and get attention from parents, that being the environmental part of it, right? So in talking about like how you are in school or whatever it is you set your mind to be successful at, there's, it's reciprocal. They all kind of interact with each other. Three ways individuals and environments interact. So different people choose different environments. So think of your friends. These individuals, your friends, can influence the way you think about school, the music you like, the clothes you wear, etc. But then our personalities shape how we interpret and react to events. So some people are calm, some people are anxious. These are what we call like our traits, right? Your reactions to an emergency will be different depending on your personality. And finally, our personalities help create situations to which we react. So how we treat others is often how they in turn treat us. If you're nice, others tend to be nice to you in return. So this is just showing that all three in that triangle, they can all three of them influence each other in different ways. So let's look at this self part. There's this word called self-efficacy. It's a person's belief about his or her skills and ability to perform certain behaviors. So the greater a person's self sense of self-efficacy, the more confident that person is in his or her ability to deal with, with life's challenges or given a particular task. So one's self-efficacy has a powerful effect on his or her behavior, but it's not considered a trait because it can be understood only in relation to specific behaviors and situations. Trait theorists say that our traits stay the same no matter what. Well, self-efficacy is saying that your efficacy changes given the situation, meaning it is not generalized across situations. All right, let's kind of shift gears and talk about personal control, our sense of controlling or being controlled by the environment. I have to kind of admit my bias here and say that up there with like Jörg Stobson Law and some other things that I can't think of right now, this is probably my most favorite concept, I guess, or one that I that resonates with me a lot is this idea of locus of control. 
Julian Rotter, make sure you know that name, that could be a really good indicator on the test, says that there are two types of personal control. There's internal locus of control and external locus of control. So external locus of control is the perception that chance or outside forces determine our fate. We say that things happen to us. Okay, why did that happen to me? We say that things happen to us. Whereas an internal locus of control is the perception that one controls their own destiny and fate. So this perception is I make things happen. Okay, I'm doing, like, what is going on right now is because I had a hand in it. I had control over this situation. And what's happening right now is because I either wanted it to or did something to make it happen. So a person is either going to have an external locus or an internal locus of control. But which is better psychologically? Most definitely the internal locus of control, which says that you influence your life. Now, how your locus of control is created really depends, and it depends on a lot of things that you don't control. So it's funny to say that we might have an internal locus of control because you having that was influenced by so many different factors, including social factors. So research has shown that internals, people with an internal locus of control, they receive higher grades. They're less likely to succumb to the pressure of others, so peer pressure to do, do certain things, and are more likely to engage in physical activity, so probably you know, a little more active and therefore healthier. There are some limitations to this internal locus of control, though simply stated because there are things in life in this world that no one, no individual can control. If you get into a car accident, that wasn't your fault. That's not your fault, right? You didn't control that. So to say, oh my gosh, what was I doing? And then blame yourself is, is like really bad. Like you can't blame yourself for things you can't control. You're gonna go crazy, right? You're gonna be so overwhelmed and stressed. So having too much of an internal locus of control really is probably just as bad as having any amount of external locus of control. All right, so sticking with this personal control thing, Martin Seligman came up with this term called learned helplessness, which you have briefly seen in previous units, but let's really talk about it here. This is the hopelessness and passive resignation, meaning the person resigns passively. They are passive, they resign, they say, I don't have any control here, so why would I even try? Martin Seligman says it's this passive resignation and it's learned when one is unable to avoid repeated traumatic events from, one, from which one cannot or feels he or she cannot escape. So if they over and over and over again in their lives have felt like, I cannot escape this, it doesn't matter what I do, I always fail this test or fail in this class. No matter what I do, she's always gonna say no. Um, no matter what I do, they're not gonna like me. Or no matter what I do, I'm never getting out of here. So that kind of mentality is what's called um, learned helplessness. They feel zero sense of control over a situation and often transfer this feeling over to other situations then. People who are given little control, for instance in prison or in a nursing home, experience a lowering of moral and increase, a lowering of morale, I'm sorry, and increased stress and often a sense of learned helplessness then occurs. And here's the thing with learned helplessness, even when they are, if someone is experiencing learned helplessness, even when they are given a leg up or a hand, helping hand, they deny it because they say it's not going to work anyway, nothing works. Right, that would be the like extreme of learned helplessness. Then we kind of have this polar opposite thing, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research recently, and it's really been kind of trending, um, this positive psychology thing, and what it is to be grateful every day and to just choose positivity. So optimism, to have an optimistic outlook is to always look on the bright side, right? So it's good to have a positive outlook, but we need a sense of reality too, as excessive optimism can be detrimental to a person, just like excessive internal locus of control can be. An excessive sense of optimism can cause a person to be blind to risks, 
such as AIDS, unwanted pregnancy, divorce, and even dropping out of college. Like, ah, it'll all be all right. I don't need protection. Ooh, that's not good. Um, or, you know, I don't, it'll be all right. I don't need to talk to him, my wife or husband about this. Like, we're fine. It's great. Stay positive, right? It's kind of like joy in Inside Out when she says, oh, be positive. And sadness says like, well, I'm positive. This is going to be awful. Something like that, right? Um, so just kind of a funny spin between joy and sadness there. But joy eventually realizes I can't be blind to sadness in life, but I can't be blind to the difficulties in life and say that joy and positivity is going to solve everything. It helps. It definitely helps, but it doesn't solve everything. Individuals with an abundance of optimism also tend to be overconfident when least competent at a task. So when they're like awful at something, yet they act like they're the best at it. Well, that's not good either. It's definitely like a turn off to other people. So what are the criticisms of this perspective of, of social cognitive? Well, it focuses too much on the situation, right? So if trait theory is or is criticized for underestimating the situation. Social cognitive is criticized for overemphasizing the situation or environment. So much so that it fails to recognize a person's inner traits. It doesn't even recognize their kind of personality. It does not look at the influence of unconscious motives, that's the psychoanalytic, our emotions or pervasive traits that many psychologists also believe influence our behaviors. So they're kind of um, criticized for underestimating the other perspectives. So let's talk about assessing the self. The self being the organizer of our thoughts, feelings, and actions, right? Like that's your conscious self. It's most important item in personality according to humanistic psychologists, which we've talked about already. So self-esteem, meaning feeling of self-worth, is beneficial. So people who feel good about themselves have fewer sleepless nights, do not conform easily, which is a good thing to stand out and be different, are more persistent during difficult tasks in that they're going to persevere through difficulty, are less shy and lonely, and are generally happier, right? Like, we want people to have a good self-esteem. And then there's this thing called self-serving bias. This is our readiness to perceive ourselves favorably. People accept more responsibility for good deeds than for bad. So if you like, if you do really well on a test, you say, yes, that's because I'm a genius. But if you fail a test, well, it's because the teacher is mean and hates you or like my pencil broke or I was having a bad day. So whatever. So most people see themselves as better than average. That's the self-serving bias. Individualism versus collectivism. We briefly talked about this before too. Individualists have more of an emphasis on the independent self. The self being defined by personal values, personal goals, and attributes. This is more of the Western culture of the world, especially we Americans. And then collectivists have more of an emphasis on the collective self, the interdependency of groups of people. So the self is defined by connections with friends and family, with the goals of the group having higher priority than the individual goals. So the social cognitive kind of wrapping up our unit on personality because it's behavioral and that it's talking about how we are learning through the social presence of things, but also how we're thinking about all of that happening. Um, so this being kind of the final summation of unit 10.